I'm Tony. And I'm John. And this is AstroCast. Episode 2 of AstroCast, <laughs> two. quick little recap of last episode if you haven't seen it. We covered installing Asterisk on a Slackware box. Uh, we covered what packages you needed to download in order to properly install Asterisk, what order to do them in, a few of the extensions, um, how to set those up, adding one phone, we did a couple, we did echo test, um, and we talked about how we are going to be setting up some voicemail. So today what we're going to cover is um, going through some of your extensions, such as extension, or some of your configuration files, such as extensions.conf, um, voicemail.conf, and meetme.conf, which is for setting up conference bridges. So we're going to go ahead and get started with this now. Um, we're going to shoot on over to our on screen, and uh, John's going to take it from here. But first we're going to go ahead and uh, explain a little bit about macros and how to use them with your extensions, or with your configuration files. Um, to save you time in the long run. All right. So, what 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 are okay? So basically, what we have now is a normal extensions.com with a handwritten extension. And basically, our handwritten extensions works good for for a few phones. But you know, if I had a widespread deployment, you know, 100 phones or something like that, I would not want to write all of my extensions by hand. So right here I've got my SIP context with my, uh, where my extensions say 100 and my first one calls my phone and the second one hangs up after 20 seconds. Okay, so we, we'd like to automate this process so we can add as many phones as we wanted to and, uh, and, and maybe not have to uh, add them all by hand. So what we, what we do is we create what's called a macro. A macro is a simple way of just recreating a process over and over and over again. It's similar in Microsoft Excel, or um, you can do macros in C. You can do macros in about any any decent programming language. You can do macros in. And that. for you audio video tech heads, you understand what macros are from audio video. An example, of that fact, would be you turn on your receiver, and turn your receiver turns on your TV, which then turns on your DVD player, which then turns on 5.1 surround, or you can set it up for. Video sure. game consoles, VCR. Sure. Macros are widely used in tons of things. Sure. They just make your life a lot easier. Sure. So basically what we do is uh, every macro context has to start with the word macro and have a dash. The da After the dash is exactly what the macro is called. So, for example, uh, our macro is going to be called dial me. All right. Underneath dial me, we need to make our same extend rules. But the difference is, is we don't put a extension number. We just put S here, and uh, we put our priority, and then we put what we want to do, dial, sip, slash, 
we say parentheses, dollar sign, capital ARG, one. And what this will do is allow us to pass a variable up to, up to the macro. If you compare this to our other, other SIP context, you'll, you'll realize what we're kind of doing here. So basically we have the exact same thing except we have an S context and 100, and 100 down here. So what we're going to go ahead and we're going to just space this down. We're going to eventually delete that, but we're going to make it extend 100, comma, 1, comma, dial, no, I'm sorry, macro, and then the macro name. So the macro name is dial me, comma, the variable we want to pass. What this will do for us is when extension number 100 gets called, it's going to actually pass it into the macro rather than, uh, rather than actually running it in the sub context. Now, obviously this doesn't look very useful right now because we have a two line context and a, we have to write one line in order to get to it. So we have to actually write one extra line in order to get there. But if we had voicemail in here or we had um, call forwarding and all the other stuff written into here, it would actually make the process a lot simpler. And we're not exactly sure what our uh, viewing audience is like. But anyone that's using this in an uh, industry, in industry or in a business situation, setting up 50 or 60 um, extensions, you're definitely saving yourself time by doing macros. Right, and I'd also like to make one correction, one uh, mistype. The dollar sign actually goes outside of the brackets, and I knew that before I typed, but I made a mistake. So, <laughs> all right, anyway, so we save, our, we save, we reload, asterisk, and with all luck, I should be able to dial 100. So, it passed it into our, it went ahead and passed it into our macro, and you can see that here where it says executing macro dial me 100. Then you'll see dial OSP SIP slash 100. So, basically, it did exactly what we wanted it to do. So, adding another extension in the extensions comp is as simple as saying extend 101, comma 1, comma macro dial me 101. And that will, um, as long as we have a 101 in our SIP comp or our IX comp for whatever, and we, we'll go ahead and, and add a, a 101 if it's not already added in here. Okay, we'll go ahead and add a, extension 101. Our type is a friend because we're going to add another phone eventually. Our username will be just be 101. Our secret will be phone. Our will we'll disallow. All, all protocols that were specified before and allow EULA because we're on our local network and we're not too concerned about bandwidth. Our host could be anything. And our context is default. And we'll go over later on how you can set up permissions with your context. Um, so if you want a person to only be able to dial internal extensions or you want a person only to be able to dial 1-800 numbers, we can actually show you how to do that context. It's actually a really good way to make permissions for certain things. All right, so basically if we went at reload, um, we could uh, right here is where our second phone, if authenticated, all we'd have to do is dial 101. But of course it's going to hang up on us because there is no 101. Okay. So that basically explains what a macro is. But let's say we wanted to throw voicemail into the mix. Let's, uh, let's, let's get a little crazy here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dangerous. All right. So all the voicemail is located at etc.voicemail.com. So we'll go ahead and go in there. And basically there's a few, a few settings you can set in here. Um, basically I normally leave everything, everything default. So except for the format. Normally the format comes... Wave, maybe G729 if you have the license, and GSM. If you're not worried about making a web page to download your voicemail or things like that, just leave it at GSM. There's no re for, reason for it to record three streams at a time. I just want to interject here. We do have voicemail set up as well as a conference bridge. Um, <clears throat> right now our voicemail number is 712-432-8005. Um, you can leave us some voicemails there if you have any questions, and if you, if you do, we can either reply to you if you leave us an email address, or we can try to answer the questions on show. Um, Coming up pretty soon, we'll be using our conference bridge to take live calls, um, 
and we'll probably I think we'll start scheduling some conferences that we'll just have either before or after or we're done recording some of that effect and we'll mm -hmm. put that on the front page and in the forums. Second of all, we do have the forums up now, so if you'd like to sign up, um, ask some questions, you can post in there. And we've added a new section, downloads to our site. There we'll be putting um, any scripts that we write, um, any how-tos, and uh, as well as I, we're going to put some software in there. Right now we have some soft phones for people that don't yeah. want to buy them. You don't have to look for them. You can just go to ashcast.com, click on the downloads link, and go to soft phones. Right. And I also wrote a script, which I'll be showing you later, to manage um, to manage conferences, to be able to keep people out of your conference. Okay. So we're still in our voicemail.com. And um, basically what we're going to look at here is our, we have a server email, which I normally leave as asterisk. You can change it to like do not reply or something if you want to. <coughs> if you're going to do that, I would recommend sending, sending your server email to like do not reply at yourdomain.com. But we're not going to worry about that because this is our simple in-home setup. Um, okay, the other important one would be the attach equals yes. What this does is not only sends you an email when you have a new voicemail, it actually attaches the WAV file of that voicemail to your to your message. Okay. And other than that, now if you're using a limited inbox, then you're not going to do yeah, that. Yeah, I would turn that off. But if you're like using Gmail, you're probably not going to have a problem. Yeah, you're not going to have a problem. All right. So basically, that, that that's pretty much the important things inside the voicemail comp. There's a lot of stuff you can do in here, and and this file has been very 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 well. Documented um, above the uh, above the command that you can normally do. So what what we're going to do is just go ahead and go to the bottom here and add our voicemail in. I highly suggest that you guys take the time to sit down, read through the config files. Mm -hmm. They're really easy to understand after you look at them a couple times. Um, we will get more depth in the future into the voicemail, some of the top more advanced features you can do with them. Um, but it's nothing you guys can't figure out yourself if you open it up and just read. Right. It's really not that hard to understand what they're trying to tell you. They tell you what it does, they show you an example of what, how to set it up, and then you can just add your own envelope. Right. Okay, so notice that we're in the other context down here. So we, that's important for the rest of this, uh, for, for when we actually go and set it up. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and set up voicemail for extension 100. And what this first option is, is, is the voicemail password. When I set up voicemail, I always set it up with the same password as the username because you can change that later. The next one is the user that, that's associated with this account, and that would be me. And lastly is the email to send it to. Okay, so there, we, we've set up our voicemail conf, but we haven't associated it with us yet. So, and we don't have even a way to dial into our voicemail yet. So I'm going to go ahead and reload asterisk. But then I'm, I'm going to also go into my extensions.com. I'm going to go all the way down to my SIP context at the way bottom, and I'm going to add a new extension, extension 500. I normally make my voicemail extensions somewhere higher than my normal extensions, so um, so it's out of the way, and it's not like in the middle of dialing or something. So like if you've got extension 100 is me, extension 101 is voicemail, extension 102 is Tony, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I normally make my voicemail up really high. So I say voice, mail, main, and then I also, so I have an automatic login, I use the caller ID num variable. Remember, we're at other inside of our, inside of our uh, voicemail conf, so we put at other. If it doesn't work, it's probably because you forgot the at whatever you have. Right, if it doesn't try to automatically log in, <clears throat> you probably just forgot the at other. Mm -hmm. So, if Tony went and dialed 500 as long as I typed everything right, let me double check one more time. Voicemail main, Okay, Tony should be able to go and dial extension 500. I see where I made my mistake. So let's go back in one more time. It's very important that when you write these variables out, you get uh, <laughs> you don't you don't put the wrong kind of brackets at the end of your uh, end of your statement. Go ahead, Tony. So now it just asked us for our password and nothing else. Okay. So we made our password 100, so Tony can go ahead and type 100. You have no messages. Your voicemail? No messages. Alright. So if you're setting this up in a larger area where 
let's say you want to be able to check your voicemail from any phone, any situation, you wouldn't do it this way. You'd want to pick up the phone, enter your mailbox number, enter your password. But when most people are just going to be checking their voicemails at their own local phones, then you just go ahead and sign it. Right. And, and there is, I don't remember the exact command, Tony. Tony uses voicemail more than I do. There is a way to get around to other voicemails while you're inside of your voicemail mm -hmm. box. And I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. I think so, it involves a pound. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it involves a pound or a, the asterisk yes. on the phone. So, okay, so we've set up our voicemail, but we have no way to leave our user a voicemail. So let's go ahead and edit our extensions.com and our newly created macro. So what I do is I'm going to add a new priority. And what, what's kind of important to remember here is that um, if a time limit's been reached for, in our example, 20 seconds, or 20, 20 seconds worth of rings. It's not 20 rings, yeah. It's, it's 20 seconds worth of rings. Which is usually about three, maybe four. Yeah, maybe four rings you'll get out of that. Um, it actually goes 1 plus 101, which is kind of confusing for your priority. So basically after 20 rings, it's going to skip to priority 102. That's kind of confusing, but after you've done it a few times, you just accept it and move on. <laughs> so then you say voicemail, and then I normally do unavailable 200, or I also do B200, busy 200. So if somebody's on the phone, instead of saying that the user is unavailable, it's going to say that they're busy. Okay, and then we also make our hang up variable go to 104. Okay, but so we've got one phone here. We're not going to get too far by just calling ourselves 100 times. Exactly. So let's make a quick transfer to voicemail extension. So if our normal extension is 100, let's make a new extension called 8100. Now what this is going to be useful is, specifically more in a business situation, let's say you can tell someone's on the phone or they just don't want to take a call right now. You can just pick up, dial 8100 and transfer them to the current voicemail. And I made a mistake here too, it should have been U100 and B100 because the, the, the 100 after the U is the, is the extension. So um, just keep that in mind that it's U for unavailable plus the extension. Okay. so. We're going to go ahead and give them the busy message rather than the unavailable message. So that way if somebody calls in, uh, they know that we're on the phone. So we can tell our secretary, hey, we're on the phone. Tell them we're on the phone and they can transfer us directly to voicemail. Now with all luck, this will work. Tony? Okay, so what actually happened there is we had a voicemail box set up, but um, so Tony already had his message recorded. So just ignore that. By default, you'll get you know Allison saying the person at extension 100 is busy. Please leave your name after the tone. We already went in and configured our mailbox. So what I want to do is we'll go back. We'll call back into our mailbox just as though we were calling it, and I'll show you some of the setup features. Let, let me let me show you one more thing about voicemail that may or may not be interesting to you. Okay, so since Tony's going to dial 500, and we know what his caller ID number is, if we add the letter S in front of the caller ID num, it's actually going to automatically log in. It will not ask him for a password. So let's go ahead and have him go ahead and dial it. You have no message. Put me right in. Okay, so we'll record my unavailable message. Hi, this is Tony. I'm not available right now. Leave a message and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you. Hi, this is Tony. I'm on the other line right now, but if you leave a message, I'll call you back as soon as I'm done. Thanks. Thank you. Press 1 to accept this recording. Press 2 to listen to it. Press 3 for the next option. Press 4 to 
Okay, now we can go on. I can record just my name. There's a lot more things you can do in this mailbox. Those are just some of the basic setup features yep. to get you going. So that, that'll, that'll get you set up and going here. All right, so we've done voicemail. We, we know how we do voicemail. The only other thing that I'm going to I'm gonna tell you about voicemail is in the voicemail conf. Since we chose our format as only GSM, that's not going to do us too good when it emails it to us. So if you want to have an email it to you, we need to add the wave option as well. And what that does is it records a GSM stream, which is good. GSM is, is cool, as the people from Digium would say. And Wave is just the uncompressed version of the message. Now, the reason Wave is good is because you can listen to it in a Mac, you can listen to it on a Linux box, or a Windows box. Right, right. So, so I mean, just keep that in mind. <laughs> or a GNU operating system. Or, or the GNU operating system, whatever. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so, okay. So, basically, that, that leaves us with how to do conferencing. Now, conferencing can either be easy or it can be hard. It just it depends on your options. We're going to make an easy conference. Yes. Okay. Um, if you want music on hold and things like that, then you're probably it would be above the level of that that we're going to go here. We have set those kind of conferences up before. And we might get to that later on, but right now our goal in the first few episodes here is to get you up and running with all the features that are easily. Available and accessible in Asterisk. Right. And then from that point, we can take you in further, delve deeper into the available options and that. Yep. And uh, we want to actually get into some hardware here coming up. Later on in the show, we're going to show you how to set up a TDM 400p card from um, Digium, right. which will um, have FXS and FXO chips on board. So that's exactly what we want to do. Right. Um, but we'll get done with the conference calls and we'll go to that. Okay. So with the meet. Okay, what, what, what constitutes a conference? Last time we talked about um, that in order to set up a conference, you need the ZT dummy driver in order to make it function correctly. Well, there's a problem with that. My sweet machine I've got sitting under this desk here has a problem with the USB controller. So uh, since the last episode, we've upgraded to kernel 2.6.15, I believe. Yes, 2.6.15. All we had to do was, was copy the the default Slackware 2.4.26, I think, comes with 10.2, and copied it into the new directory. We did a make, um, and then basically copied the BZ image and did a make modules and make modules underscore install, and uh, rebooted the box, or added to Lilo Conf, ran Lilo, rebooted the box, and we were good. And as long as your USB controller is not having any problems, yeah, you should have any problems. You'll be fine, then as long as your USB stuff's getting loaded, right? All right, so basically, the meat and potatoes of meet me, is uh, or, or the conferencing is the meetme.com. Okay, the meetme.com has a couple of options, especially new to 1.2. Basically, the audio buffer, which I don't normally mess with, and I don't really actually know what it does since it's so new. I I, I, know, I don't really ever mess with it, so don't mess with it unless you know what you're doing. So basically, we're going to add a simple conference, and we're going to have our conference be conference number 1,000. All right, so we've got a conference, and the interesting thing about meetme.conf is every other conf file, pretty much, you have to type reload after you're done. The meetme.conf, you do not have to type reload; it gets dynamically reloaded. Yeah. So that that's that's sort of important to our whole our whole deal here. So now we need a way to get into our conference. So far, we have none, <laughs> but we can easily add another extension. Now you're kind of seeing where the macros come in handy. Yeah. Well, we're going to add an extension. Um, let's see, 200 for our for our for our Meet Me conference. And that's it. Now, when I reload, when you add it to the extension, when you add the the way to get to the Meet Me conf in in the in, that, in the in the extensions.conf, you have to reload when you add the conference. So if I added any more conferences after this, and I still want them to be on number 500, I don't have to I don't have to do anything. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to download our conference, but before we can do that, we have to load the ZT dummy driver. Since, since we didn't have um, uh, an actual asterisk card to do the timing, we had to still choose our ZT dummy driver. In order to do that, we mod pro ZT dummy. Okay, so that should have loaded it into our LS mod, um, and we noticed that it did. It loaded the Zaptel driver, and it loaded ZT dummy. But that's kind of a pain to have to load that every time. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to edit our rc.local script, and we've already written, written where it's going to start asterisk in safe mode. We're also, before we actually do that, we're going to mod probe. And 
And I know what some of you, some of you uh, hardcore uh, Linux guys are out there saying, why do you need to add that to the modules.com? Well, for the simple reason that if I remove asterisk or something like that, I don't want to try to mod from a module that's not there. I know it doesn't make much of a difference, but to me it makes it cleaner. So you guys can do it however you want. Uh, I'm going to do, do it this way. So <laughs> Tony should be able to, let me get into asterisk here yeah. so they can see the conference go. Okay. You should be able to call in. Which is 1,000. Okay, so we're, we're in the conference right now. We could have other people call into the conference. Um, one cool thing you can do with this that we're not going to show you today, but we'll show you later is, let's say I'm the only person at the conference and I'm really bored. You put on, um, you put music on for the first person that sits there, and as soon as a new person comes in, it'll drop the music and wait for the second person to come in. So, so maybe now what we could go through is a little bit about what the manager.conf is and um, how that can pertain to your conference based on the software that I just created, uh, the Asterisk Conference Manager built with Ajax. Okay. First off, that might be kind of important to, to explain what Ajax is. To explain what Ajax is. Ajax is not a new, it's not, it's not like a brand new idea, or it is, it is a new idea, but it's not a, it's not a new programming language. Basically, what Ajax is, depending on who you talk to, Ajax is sort of a JavaScript language that downloads web pages in real time. So, I mean, you know, Ajax doesn't have a home, it doesn't really have an RFC, it's just a programming language or a programming concept based originally in JavaScript. So what I created was, um, was a simple way to manage a conference using Ajax. So your page, basically the, the fundamental problem with every conference manager out there and mine is not advanced at all, I'll tell you that, but the fundamental problem is you have to have a five second reload in every page and the page is to refresh. So if you've got a hundred people in your conference, you have to scroll and you want to kick the last person in your conference out, you have to scroll all the way down and click that person before your five seconds is up. My idea was is that probably not the best way to, best way to handle things, especially with technology being the way it is. So I'm going to go ahead and go to AzureCast.com. I went to the forums, but which is ashcast.com slash forms. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to click on downloads. This is a new section we just added. So if you haven't seen it yet, it's because we've got to add it. That's because we just added. I go to scripts, Astro Conference Manager, version 0.1. It's a tar bz2 file. I'm going to go ahead and save it to disk. And since I'm logged in as root, put it there. All right. So now we go tar minus jxvf asterisk underscore conference manager. All right, so here's all the stuff you need for asterisk conference manager. There's a simple how to install, um, already written. The license, um, it's licensed under GPL, so if you, if you load this file up, you'll see that it's just a copy of the GPL version two. All right, so first thing I'm gonna do is go to my asterisk stuff directory. The asterisk stuff contains an example of how to do the manager comp, how to do the meet me comp, which is exactly the way we did it. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and copy my the manager comp that come with this. And your your mileage may vary. If you've made changes to your manager comp, do not copy this file. But we, we haven't made changes to our manager comp. All right, so there's that. Now I'm going to go into my pages, and I'm going to go ahead and copy all of these files, and I'm just going to go ahead and copy it to the root of my HTTP server. Okay? I'm also going to need to enable PHP, so don't let me forget. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to go to my asterisk directory first, and I'm going, to, I'm going to show you what the manager comp is and what it does. All right, so the manager comp basically allows you to connect in using a, using a sort of a telnet interface to control asterisk. So you can list all your users, you can you can, you can basically manage asterisk through a telnet interface. It allows people to write scripts to control asterisk or web pages or whatever. Um, so the first thing you do is you have to enable it. It's by default, no. I use the default port and I bind it to the 127 address. It is not safe to bind asterisk or bind the manager to anything else but 127. If you, if you do it, it's at your own wrist. wrist. 
risk, risk, whatever. Risk. Just don't do it. Let's put it that way. Just don't do it. Okay. But the basic one we're using for this whole for this whole uh, connection is we're using our our username context and with the password of password. I don't recommend this. I would recommend changing it. Yeah. All right. So basically, we're denying everyone, and and in this permit overrides deny. So you can deny everyone and then allow a block of IDs. What we're doing here is we're only allowing 127.0.0.1 only that address to connect in with the right privileges of system call, log, verbose, command, agent, user, and all. If you don't know what those are, look them up. I'm not going to explain them all. Alright, so we have to reload asterisk. Okay, so our new manager settings have taken effect. Trust me. You can look by seeing netstat minus TNA there is a 5038 bound to 127.0.0.1. That's safe. All right, so now I'm going to make sure my PHP is enabled. And in, if you install Slackware, you can actually go into htdoc, etc., Apache, and then it's httpd.com. And then I usually just search for PHP, and it wasn't loaded. So we're going to go ahead and unhash it. And we're going to... We're going to make sure that it starts every time we start the box. So what we do is we make the HTTPD script executable. And we go ahead and we start HTTPD. And I forgot to write the word start. All right, so, after, so this is loaded. So now if I was to open up a web browser, which is already open, and go to 127, find my numlocks on, 127.0.0.1. So as it works, so we did something right. But we still haven't configured our media manager yet. So we're going to go into var www htdocs where we had copied our media manager before. We're going to edit, as per the install file, the output file. And it, it just so happens that everything but our conference number is correct. So we've got username, password, our manager server, which is the local host, and our conference number. So if you would change the username context, you would change this box right here. If you would change the password, you would change this box. And if you would change the server, you would change this box. And Don't I would change the server. Yeah, I would <laughs> not recommend changing the server. And you can do it. You can run this remotely. Not recommended, but you can. Um, and then basically, the conference number goes here. So with all luck, I should be able to load up index.php and see that I'm managing conference 1000. Now, I haven't tried this over IP yet, so this will be interesting if it actually works. So go ahead and dial in, Tony. Oh, no. Yeah, that was my fault. Case ID or conference number followed by the pound key. You are currently the only... Alright, here we are. So we are, we're there, but since we're, it's, a, it's an IP to IP call. This won't actually work correctly. It does work through TDM, and I'm working on making it work over IP. But the way we can temporarily make it work is by going through an option that we weren't going to go through tonight, but that's okay. <laughs> we go into extensions comp. And before we dial, for example, we'll go extend 100. Comma, one, comma. Set caller ID to 555, 555, 5555. So what we're doing here is, if you ever want to be able to spoof your caller ID, there you go. That does not set the ANI. So no, no, all, no, no, no. all of you guys, you can set the ANI, but we're not going to go into that right now. Yeah, yeah. So now this should make it work. With all with all luck, did I close the web browser most of the time? I believe you did. So we'll go ahead and reopen it here. Alright, okay. let's let's uh okay, go ahead. Please send your contract number followed by the time key. It didn't set our caller ID. So, I mean, basically, the only other way to do this is like a huge hack, um, and it, this, this will definitely not work. I mean, it, it'll work, but it's, it, it's retarded, so, but I'll do it anyway, just to show you how this works. Extend, 200, 
M1 comma set caller ID 555 555 Alright, now Tony will dial it. Alright, Tony, go ahead and dial in. Alright, so you see us set our caller ID here to 555 Okay, so I'm going to log into 1000 now. And with any luck, it says 555 555 Here's the cool part. I'm currently in the conference bridge. He clicks my number. It will, it, this probably won't actually disconnect him because it's only set up for a Zaptel channel, but we'll find out here. You see, it didn't kick him because it was only set up for a Zaptel channel. Yeah, it's yeah. not set up for SIP. And um, that's, that's a planned feature of the next version. But this is kind of to get you the idea of what it's like. So if you have to manage dial-in conferences, this is the way to go. Or if you need an example about how to use Ajax with Mimi or Ajax with anything, the Asterisk Conference Manager is, 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 is something you probably should look into. And Ajax is amazing. Just Ajax is rocking. Yeah. I mean, I've been doing PHP for five years. And um, I was excited when, when I saw PHP the first time. And I actually wrote my first PHP script, and uh, and when I saw Ajax, I'm like, I have to learn how to do that. And I was talking to another web programmer, and he said, Ajax is pretty hard, but NFL.com uses it. I said, really? So I never actually went to NFL.com, but I understood the concept that that uh, basically the XML HTTP requester has to stay open. It actually keeps opening a connection back. To the, to, to the web server and keeps reloading that page over and over and over again. It's a neat concept. And you might want to explain, though, the problems you're going to incur if you're trying to view it with Internet Explorer. Um, I have it fixed now, but um, Internet Explorer 6, supposedly version 7 will have this fixed. I'm not a Microsoft guy, so I, I don't know much about any of this. And I, I know from experience that Microsoft will say something one week and the next week it will go away. I, you know, I, don't, I don't know if this is still the case, but basically, in order to make XML HTTP requests work in, uh, in, in Internet Explorer, you have to do an act, it's an ActiveX control, so it's painful to make, you got to make a normal XML HTTP request for any other browser but Internet Explorer, and then if that doesn't work, then you open up the ActiveX control from Microsoft. So, um, it should work on your computer. If it doesn't, let me know, and I can I can work on fixing it. Um, I just started the script, and I wrote it in a couple hours. So if there's something wrong with it, I apologize. Post it in the forum. Post it in the forum. Go to the forum, post it. I'll try to get it corrected. This is only version point one. It was a proof of concept to see that if I could actually do AJAX. This is my first AJAX program. Yeah. All right. So what's next? I think what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and uh, sh explain to you a little bit about the TDM 400P um, card. We'll give you the idea of what it is here, and then we'll also explain um, what exactly uh, its purpose is, and we're going to show you a configuration file on how to configure it. And then we're actually going to go install it in one of John's boxes and show you what piece of crap we have in there currently. <laughs> Just like what I installed in my box at home. The wild card. Yes. Yeah, well, That's, it worked good for a while. Yeah. All right. Big boys play with big toys. Big boys play with big toys, and if you're going to... If you're gonna do something, put your money where your mouth is. Yeah, a lot of money where your mouth is. Actually, we've been. I found these cards pretty cheap. The cards aren't so expensive. The cards are about fifty bucks, but the actual uh, FXS and FXO chips are looking about sixty-nine to seventy bucks a pop. Right. So. And I put I put four on mine. I have one FXO and the three FXSs, which we'll show you in a second. But basically, what I'll, what I'll show you first, or maybe Tony will cut this and it'll be afterwards. I don't know. But. <laughs> um, Here's how I configured mine in my house. So since I have three FXS ports, I have the ability to have three normal phones in my house be on totally different lines from each other. So what I've done is, uh, in my Asterisk install, first thing to look at would be the Zap Telecom. And basically, what you do is, and it's kind of confusing because even though they're FXS ports, they have to be configured like FXO ports. It is completely backwards from anything I've seen, but anyway, anyway, one through three on my card are FXS ports, but they have to be configured as FXO. So here's my three FXO ports, and my one FXS, which is actually my FXO. FXO will connect me to Quest, and it expects dial tone from Quest. FXS puts out dial tone. So 
FXO, FXS ports need to be configured like FXO. Don't forget that. And since I'm from the U.S., I need to load zone U.S. and my default zone will be the U.S. Are you confused yet? How are you confused? <laughs> All right. So after I've done my Zapto comp, I run my ZTCFG minus. I usually add a couple of these afterwards, and I go ahead and slap the enter key, and it tells me that all of my channels on my on my card are configured. All right. So there's the first step. Now I go into my asterisk directory, and I edit my my Zapata.com. Zapata, if you've read any history, is the guy that first uh, first thought that you could make cheap cards to put into computers to make them PST incompatible. So, Mr. Zapata, we thank you. All right. So, my um, there's uh, there's basically one context inside the Zapata.com, and that's the channels context. The, the channel the channels context basically. Um, sets a couple of options for our for our machine. Um, basically what I've set up here is that I want echo cancel, I want echo cancel when I'm talking to somebody, I want caller ID to be passed and I don't want to hide it and if, if music on hold actually worked uh, this would play music. My signaling for my 1 through 3 cards is FXO once again backwards. These are actually FXS ports that are being configured as FXO ports. That is way confusing and I know that in I apologize, but it's not our fault. It's not our fault. <laughs> All right. The context that I want to pass these calls to are the local context inside my extensions.com. So anytime that I pick up the phone and dial a number, I want it to pass to my local and go follow that dial plan. All right. So my FXO port, which is configured as an FXS port, I want to send when somebody calls that or when that thing gets a ring. I want to pass it to my local incoming so I can ring the phones in my house. And that would be on channel 4. That's, that's number 4 on the card. Okay, so I'm going to go a little bit into myextensions.com. I'm not going to get too advanced into myextensions.com because I don't really need to confuse people right now. But I'm going to show you my local incoming. Alright, basically my local incoming, i got to cut that out. My local incoming, um, what I do is, is I have what's called Zapateller. It's another application from Digio that um, basically if somebody calls my house with no caller ID, it answers it and it passes the three call numbers not in service tone. So do 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 number number in number you've reached not in service but without the number you've reached is not in service. What this does is is when a when a telemarketer calls you, it actually goes and says, you know, this number is not in service to them and they take it off the list. So. Let's do a quick thing here with my cell phone. I'll just star six seven myself and give you a call. So you can hear this. <laughs> and while Tony's doing that, the other part of the Zapateller, uh, after that is my privacy manager. What happens there is it says no caller ID was detected, and we're going to uh, and it makes you dial in your ten digit number in order to ring my house. Okay, so we'll put this on loudspeaking so we get here. I don't know how clear it's going to be on my cell phone. Okay, so basically what that did was, since Tony dialed to my house with no caller ID, it said, hey, I don't know who you are, but you can't be calling here without a caller ID. I've already, I've already gotten uh, complaints, but that's good. That's so the point of it. that's the point. Lastly, after they pass the privacy manager rule, it calls my phones in my house, which I have three phones that, that are on each of those three cards. And it calls those for 60 seconds. After that, it hangs them up. So, in a nutshell, that's my extensions.com when somebody calls my house. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to get up and move on out, out of this room here that we lock yeah, ourselves in. the dungeon. And we're going to go ahead and uh, take the old wild card out of his box and put the new TDM 400P card in there. Show you the install of that. And let's go do that now. All right. Okay, so now we're going to show you how to install a TDM 400P card into your asterisk box to allow incoming and outgoing calls without the use of a grand stream 
or a grain stream phone. No voice over IP at all. That's correct. All right. So right here, I have a TDM400P, which I just ordered thanks to my wife letting me. Uh, what it's got on it is maybe we want to zoom in on this. Yeah. We can do that. <laughs> Alright, so what we've got here is, is we've got two reds and two greens. What the reds are is FXO ports. An FXO port is a foreign exchange office port. Basically what an FXO does is accept dial tone. So, um, for example, the new SBC, that's how you'd receive your dial tone. The green cards are FXS ports, which are station ports. Station ports allow you to connect normal analog phones to the to the card basically. So um, so what, what we can actually do with this is, um, I actually only have one phone line at my house and I will be replacing one of these red ones with the green one, but I'll have, be able to have three analog phones plugged into my card um, and be able to dial one line out to the PSTN and the rest of my will go voice over IP to wherever I want. So my wife can be on the phone, I can be on the phone, and a friend of ours can be on the phone. All separate phone calls, normal analog phones, not IP. So what Tony's going to do here is install this and uh, take out my old card that I had in here before. And so now what we're taking out is an X100P by Intel. It's a clone of the Digium wildcard modem and replacing it with a much, much better piece of equipment. This is the old modem by Intel. As you see, it has one line in, one line out, but this is just an FXO only. Now, you might want to wear a static wristband with this. But Tony's You're, touching the case, so that's it's probably right. okay. I'm grounded. <laughs> Just ask my wife. <laughs> okay, now what we, I don't know if we showed you this or not, but this card actually requires its own power. So, luckily we have some extra power from a standard power supply. We're going to plug into this. Okay, that's it. Cards installed. So as you notice, we're just running this on a simple Pentium board, but how much memory do we have in here? It's uh, got 512 of memory, and it's got a 500 megahertz Celeron. Exactly. So there's not, this isn't anything fancy. It's a perfectly good box for a perfectly not so good rack. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and another, um, another thing I forgot to mention before was that these cards, um, on, the, on the back of the card, they're numbered 1 through 4. And uh, it starts from the left-hand side, red, red, green, green. So um, the number, co the number of the outside of the back of the card corresponds with the first card on the left-hand side, like this, this red card right here. Corresponds to the first port. First port, yep. yep. And, 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 it, and it works backwards. So um, in a minute here, we're going to go and explain TDM. Okay, ladies and gents. We're going to teach you what TDM means. TDM, or Time Duplex Multiplication, abbreviated as TDM. TDM is old school. Time Duplex Multiplication. What does that mean to you? All right. So in the old days, we had the party lines, where you called up one phone number and rang your neighbor's phone, your phone, everybody else's phone. They could listen on your conversations, and you had nothing to do about it. Well, the phone guys got smart, amazingly, and uh, created this thing called time duplex multiplication so everyone on your neighborhood could be on the same phone line. A little bit how it works. If you picture a motor, and, and then you picture lots of little electrodes coming off of that motor, and a little thingy in the middle that spins, and hits all of these electrons as it goes around, that's the way time duplex multiplication works. It shares a single line with everybody. That thing spins so fast you don't even know it spins. I mean, that in a nutshell is time duplex multiplication. So the card we installed today, the TDM card, basically is electronically able to share the phone line with everything else. But the PSTN understands time duplex multiplication. If you plug something in that, like a digital port into into the into the telephone system it ain't gonna work because it doesn't understand TDM.
So that's going to do it for the second episode of AstroCast. Um, we've covered a lot today, so sit down, watch this a couple times, try to figure it out. If you have any questions, you can email me at Tony at AstroCast.com or John at Tell Astrocast. your friends. Yeah, tell your friends. We had a lot of viewers on the first show. We were actually surprised. We're hoping to get some more this time. Um, don't completely whore us out, but if you wouldn't mind posting it in a couple places, get us up so people know about it. We are re relatively new, hence we're not quite out there all the way. Mm -hmm. um, what I do want to remind you of is we do have voicemail. Once again, it's 712-432-8005. You can leave a message for us there. Um, we've added a section to our downloads on astrocast.com on the download links under scripts called Viewer Submitted Scripts. If you guys have any AstroCast or Astro scripts that you think would be cool or you want to put out there, email them to me, either me or John. Again, that's Tony at AstroCast or John at AstroCast.com. Um, and we'll submit them up there, put your name on it, credit given where credit due. Yep. Um, so once again, that's going to do it. Your for script, your, hold on. on. If the scripts need to be GPL, if they're not GPL, we won't put them up there. Yeah. I mean, we're not going to get a big licensing issue saying someone stole our script. So, yep. yeah, if it's not open source and you don't want people editing and messing with your stuff, don't submit it. Right. You good? I think that's it. Okay, so that's going to do it for episode two. Once again, my name is Tony. And I'm John. And thanks for watching the number one video video cast for Astros out there. Astrocast. Astrocast.